All right, folks, public health preparedness has come a long way since September 11th and the anthrax attacks in 2001. We started with HSPD-8, the target capabilities, and the national planning scenarios. Now we have PPD-8, and we have core capabilities and CDC capabilities. But the bottom line is what we prepare for the most happens the least. We're always focused on bioterrorism and pandemics, and yet, as we've heard today, it's natural disasters and mass shootings and things like that that end up getting us all the time and we're most involved in responding to. So what's the solution to that? Well. Bottom line is, every emergency is a public health emergency. We're going to be involved in the response. If we're not initially, we're going to be eventually. And so we need to be at the table in terms of the planning. If we're not there as a partner from the beginning, we're going to fail when we have to respond to these incidents because they're going to occur and they're going to need us. We need an all-hazards approach. What is all-hazards? It means not just looking at scenarios. It means looking at capabilities. It's using your hazard and vulnerability assessments to determine where it is you need to focus your efforts. And it means taking those capabilities and practicing them in all sorts of different types of scenarios not just public health related. Collaboration is key, folks. We need to break down silos. This is a team sport. We need to be working with our traditional and our non-traditional partners. We're ESF8. We're big. We've got lots of different messy parts of our organization that don't always fit well into our constructs. We need to bring them in. This is a team sport. We need to work together. We heard that funding is going to be cut and it's on the horizon. All of our activities need to get our folks together. We need to get the most bang from our buck and we need to enhance our capabilities while working with our partners in terms of preparing for all hazards. Derecho. How many of you have ever heard of the word derecho before June 29th, 2012? <laughs> well, Lord knows, I didn't know what it was other than a Spanish word that maybe meant some kind of culinary delight. But after June 29th, I'll never forget it. And we in the North, in the Mid-Atlantic and in the, in the Midwest got hit with a very severe derecho. Now, that derecho killed 22 people nationwide. In Fairfax, we had three deaths related to that derecho. We had severe infrastructure damage. We had a historic regional 911 outage that, quite frankly, is still being talked about and investigated by the FCC. And that derecho certainly impacted critical county communications, infrastructure, and not just public safety infrastructure, but also healthcare infrastructure, hospitals, nursing homes, dialysis centers, et cetera. We had to be quick on our feet in responding to that derecho, and we sure enough were. After when the derecho hit in our county, our 911 operators experienced a 400% increase in 911 calls. Now, Fairfax County is a county of 1.2 million in the national capital region. We're a big county, lots of resources. To have an overwhelming call by him related to that derecho storm in a matter of an hour or so was ridiculous. So our public safety agencies ran their butts off like they do most often during emergencies, and then we in the county came in and backfilled them. We stood up our emergency operations center and our joint information center. We brought in our hospital partners through our regional hospital coordination center. And through ESF-8, we coordinated with our ESF-8 partners, our hospitals, dialysis centers, our nursing homes, et cetera. We had to figure out an older way to communicate, so we had to use radios and text messages and emergency alert systems. 911 eventually went down. People could not call us, so we were not getting information. Extended care facilities, they're a vulnerable population. We've got 16 of them in our county. They don't get a lot of resources and they don't always get as much attention as they should to prepare for emergencies. They were impacted critically by the storm. So a couple of weeks before the derecho, we did a survey. We do the survey every couple of years with them. We updated our contact information. We found out how they were doing with their preparedness. And we said, hey, we want to do a workshop in September to bring you guys in and talk about preparedness. Yeah, great, we'll get back to you. Two weeks before derecho. Well, derecho hits. More than 50% of our nursing homes lose power for an extended period of time. We couldn't communicate with them. Thank God we had their information, though, with that update. And we, our biggest goal was to prevent them from evacuating their patients to our already overburdened hospitals in the region. And so we had to make sure that that didn't happen. So partnership paid off. We had that information. We were able to communicate with them. Those that we couldn't communicate with to find out how they were doing, we had our public safety folks from the EOC Coordination Center go out and check on them, do welfare checks. We had Dominion Power in the EOC, and thank God they were there. They were able to prioritize restoration, and we were able to keep them from evacuating. Well, after the derecho, we had that workshop, and 95% of our nursing homes showed up at that <laughs> workshop. What a miracle, right? It's amazing what a storm will do for your preparedness. Since then, we've formed a regional extended care working group with all 40 facilities in Northern Virginia that's, that's chaired through the Northern Virginia Emergency Response System. Using HPP funds, we're working to do surge and evacuation planning with these folks. We're getting them all MedCom, which is the same hospital radio system that we have in our hospitals for all of our nursing homes so that they can be prepared, and we're going to be doing evacuation planning with them. The bottom line is it's all hazards we need to be working towards, not just SNS and CRI, not just pandemics. Use your HVAs. If you're not part of the HVA process, you don't belong in this room. You need to be there with your partners at the table determining what your vulnerabilities are. 
This is an award that we got for doing a three-day, multi-day tornado exercise in March of 2012. We got this award after derecho because that three-day full-scale exercise prepared us for the derecho, which we never thought we'd see and hope we'd never see again. Thank you so much.